Hi, I'm Terence McNally, member of the Dramatist Guild. How do you feel the librettist of an opera should be credited? How should the... The librettist of a new opera be credited? I, I think he's the equal of the composer. And uh, I don't get an opera by Giuseppe Verdi and no compose, no librettist being mentioned. Uh, this should be absolutely equal. And I, I find that happening in contemporary opera more than it was even 10 years ago because they were falling into the same habit of the old operas of, you know, no one cares who wrote La Boheme Carmen. Uh, so I'm, I see some improvement there, but I think without a good libretto, you can't have a good opera. The only exception I can think of, frankly, is Il Trovatore by Verdi, which is one of my favorite operas. I've given up trying to understand the plot. I just enjoy it for the music, but most operas need a strong story and like theater, that's really, it's all musical theater. Describe the way you work with a composer on a new opera. Well, I've really only worked with one composer. I've done two up. I've done two operas with Jake Hagee, and Jake said, "Just write, override it, but write words that you think I'm going to want to set." I did not write to a any kind of poetic form, any kind of meter, and so uh, he sort of edited my writing, and I'd say. Say Dead Man Walking, maybe 50% he used. And the rest, it's, which is true when I write a musical, I would tend to over, my style is to overwrite, and hopefully the composer and lyricist find information to inspire them to uh, write a song. And some of it gets incorporated in the song, some falls by the wayside. You don't need it. And that's pretty much how I worked with Jake. I did not ever write anything to fit his music. He, Definitely the words came first. And it was very much a long distance collaboration in terms of that kind of work. Lots of discussion just sitting opposite each other. So there was collaboration. Oh, well, I mean, uh, what I gave him was kind of a, not, not something I would call a play, a sketch for what could become an opera called Dead Man Walking. Um, I wouldn't want to perform. I certainly would not say, oh, it's such deathless literature, it doesn't need music. Perform it as a play. I wrote it deliberately, knowing that half of it would probably not be set. But it was a story I cared very much about. I certainly did not feel I was doing anything less than writing a new play. Um, I'd read Sister Helen Prejean's book, the movie, of course. And then I sort of made it my own crimes. But I cared about the subject very deeply. Sister Helen is a woman you care about very much. When you meet her, she's a very powerful person. You want to honor her and somehow capture that. And uh, I thought it was so brave of San Francisco Opera to commission an opera by a young man like Jake, who had done nothing at that point but songs. And I'd never done an opera. And they originally came to me with a proposal uh, for a 19th century piece, and I said, I don't want to write an opera about French aristocrats at the 1899 when it became midnight, when it became uh, the, the 20th century. I said, get a Frenchman to do it, or why do you want to do it, Jake? You're an American. We live in such interesting times. And I thought the project had sort of died, and then one day I was walking down the street, and I said, you know, make a great opera, Dead Man Walking. And Jake paused when I called him, he said, yes. And then when we told Latvi Mansouri, the, the artistic director of San Francisco Opera, he, his pause was a little longer. Maybe it was a full minute. And they said, OK, maybe there's something there. And, and it wrote itself pretty easily. And uh, it was a wonderful experience. I, I enjoyed it. But Jake, as I said, I can't say. But, but when I worked with Verity and that son of a bitch Wagner, we fought all the time. He's, uh, He's a delightful, smart, he has a very good sense of theater. Uh, we have similar taste in music and singers. We like singing actors as opposed to just beautiful voices. And uh, it was a lovely collaboration. 
When you mentioned singers, um, were you involved in the rehearsals? Yeah, I was at, I was at every rehearsal. Joe Mantello, uh, I suggested direct it, and Joe first said, I've never directed an opera. I said, it's no different than a play, except they sing instead of speak. And it turned out Joe was very musical. He knew the score better than I did very quickly, how that theme was done much slower and in a minor key, but was basically the same music you'd heard in that scene. And I'm, I'm a little dense that way. So Joe had a great time doing it too. Uh, and you know, you got to give people their first chance, so. But there were, there were three debuts made that night. Librettist, composer, and uh, comp uh, direct director, composer, librettist. Joe, I don't think has done another opera. I don't think so. Well, of course, it's enormously popular opera. It's an acclaimed mm -hmm. opera, and it probably was very important for all the new operas that are now being written. Possibly because of the process by which you made it. Doesn't mm -hmm. sound that different from the theatrical process. No, uh, I don't know if that's how opera is usually done, but we rehearsed it like a play we, uh, every day for three weeks, from beginning to end, a lot of scene work, very detailed, I had a lot of input. Uh, I never felt, oh, this is a mysterious world, I don't know anything about it, I better shut up. And we would change words or phrases, and I'm very glad I had to be in the room. Uh, I think a composer and a uh, libretto should be joined at the hip through opening night. I believe that I can't imagine working any other way. Uh, How do you think it would benefit opera companies to credit librettists properly? To credit them? Well, sometimes you well, see a poster without their name or a website or... I, I think that's shocking when uh, a, a, an opera is that, especially... I know people are used to saying Verity's Aida, but to say dead Jake Eggie's Dead Man Walking, I would find offensive. We've done two operas. The second opera we did was an original idea of mine that was done in Dallas. And I would insist, and it was billed as Jake Hagee and Terrence McNally's The Great Scott, it was called. I can't imagine that. And the musical theater, I have been invited to opening night parties for Candor and Ebb's, a show of which I was a librettist. And I went to the producer and I said, this is, you can't send this in, you know, I'm not coming to the party. Well, you don't make such a thing. I said, no, it's the three of us have worked on this show for two years. It doesn't overnight become Candor and Ebb's The Visit. It's the three of us wrote this show. And uh, I, we just have to fight for this. But uh, I mean, I've, I'm guilty of saying Rogers and Hammerstein, South Pacific. But I do know who wrote the book. Uh, uh, so it's going to be, I think it's the first education when uh, people are introduced to a show and they know that the librettist has equal stature in the billing as the composer and lyricist. It gets known that way, but in my lifetime, it was always Rogers and Hammerstein, South Pacific. How does knowing you're going to get a proper credit, does it have any effect upon the writing? Well, sure it would. Uh, the, the main thing is to be sure you're going to have the credit before when you sign the contract. It's got to be built in. No one wants to give anybody billing. I mean. So they say, but well, one line of type in the ad costs a hundred dollars. Save a hundred if I can. No, I would insist that the contract say my name must be included. Now, if an opera company in the middle of nowhere wants to do the opera and bill nobody, there's not much I can do. But they should know they're in violation of their contract. I think maybe librettists have been too uh, timid about uh, demanding. Uh, acknowledgement, but if anyone, and you haven't asked me my opinion of what's the biggest problem with contemporary American opera, I would say, are the librettos. They're not done by people who have a sense of theater. A lot of them sound like they were written over the telephone. I'll send you a scene. Yeah, I need a scene on an iceberg. You don't feel the sweat of two heads and bodies bumping together. And I really believe passionately in uh, a strong libretto is the basis of a strong opera and the music. And uh, I think some of our composers maybe get a commission to write an opera and they're not necessarily operatic composers. Writing a song is not writing a dramatic scene. It's very different setting a poem, a wonderful American poem, uh, 
is not the same as the scene with the beginning, middle, and end. So I think it's a, I think the producers should be making better marriages between the right composer and the right lyricist. And I think maybe they're a little remiss in doing that. And I'm not going to name any names, but there's some very good composers I think are working with inferior librettists. And I want them to wake up to that fact when someone tell them they don't read it in the reviews, uh, they're not paying attention. Uh, but I do think it's the biggest issue. I think we have a lot of talented composers living right now. And I think a natural place to look are at American dramatists uh, deal in theater. Uh, it's so interesting. I remember a period when the arts were, so much money was being thrown at them when I was young. And it was probably the late 60s. And some commission was given to the 10 most prominent novelists in America to write plays. They each were given, I think, $100,000. Not one of those plays was ever completed. Uh, seven of them didn't even turn a script in. And the three that were turned in were all by very prominent writers. It's a different skill to write a play than writing a great novel. And I think we're, I think opera producers are putting the wrong, oh, their names. He wrote a bestseller. Oh, his Broadway show made a fortune. Stick them together, they'll write a hit opera. And I think you've got to be as scrupulous in putting the right people up. I always think the arts need good producers. The Medici's were good producers. Look, look what they got out of Michelangelo and, and Raffaello and all those people. Maybe they're sons of bitches, but they got the work done. You are well known as being an ardent fan of opera, as a supporter mm -hmm. of opera. Do you yourself sing or read music? No. I'm pretty much tone deaf. Uh, when I turned 40, I thought I'd try to learn to play the piano. It's ter which turns out a lot of people, when they get to middle age, decide to learn to play the piano. There's an enormous amount of literature. And uh, after about two years, and I practice every day, really, for at least an hour, I noticed my scale was not going anywhere but in a straight line. And I said to the teacher, finally, do you think I'm naturally musical? And he said, no, I don't think you'll ever get much, you know, slowly maybe, but what you want to do won't be fun for you ever. But you obviously can feel the dramatic impact. I feel it emotionally, yeah, yeah. But I can't tell a key change unless it's a big winner. The other day at the, uh, the opera, people say, oh, she's flat. I didn't hear it. That's my biggest experience when we audition musicals. I'll say, wasn't that wonderful? And the composer says, she was a quarter tone sharp, the whole song. I don't hear it. So I have opinions. People say you know a lot about music. I say, no, I have a lot of opinions about music. Is there anything you'd like to add? No, I, um, I think the main thing I said is I, I think these opera companies, they're, not, they're just groping. They're not putting the right people together, you know? And Singer, it's... No, but it, all this, these small companies that are happening in Brooklyn really sound exciting. I'm a friend of Joyce D. Donato, did great Scott, and she's very committed to one of these companies in Brooklyn. And they're really stripping it down, to, and most of them are done with a piano or minimal orchestra. And uh, just really, what is it about dramatically? And getting back to the art of opera, why it reaches something in us that a, a play can't, maybe. And uh, I, I think there's going to be a resurgence of American opera. I feel, I feel more optimistic about it than when we did Dead Man Walking, which I felt and the first Dead Man got a bad review in San Francisco and the New York Times. And I thought, well, that's, there's two years of work down the drain. It's ended up being the most produced opera of the last century, I think. Or in the Mets doing it in two years with an all-star cast and new production. And I'm very excited. March 9th, 2021, I think, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah.